Well, good morning. Welcome to Kingston West on this uh, Sunday, uh, July the 25th, or whenever you have opportunity to view this. Uh, we're glad that you've tuned in and are watching. Uh, just a couple of announcements for you in our summer schedule, and that is that prayer meetings continue. Uh, again, we do that on Zoom Thursdays at 1.30. Um, and the there's been some changes. We're in phase three here in Ontario. And uh, and for what that means for the church is that we are no longer limited to percentages or numbers of people that can be in the building at any one time. However, we're still limited to follow social distance uh, guidelines. Um, but uh, uh, so moving forward, there will be no need to pre-register to come. Just come on a Sunday morning and we'll, we'll uh, I'm sure we'll have enough space to make that work and make that fit. And uh, we look forward to <clears throat> re-engaging uh, with all of you and in the days ahead. And so uh, just plan to come. You'll have to register at the door. Uh, we'll just have a sign-up sheet that you can sign. And uh, there'll be no, no, no more temperature checks or anything like that is required. So, uh, so that's good news. And we will be singing with our masks on. So uh, that'll be a nice change as well to hear people's voices uh, singing once again. So that's all the announcements I have. <clears throat> Our call to worship uh, comes from Psalm 33, and it's verses 1 to 5. And it says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we have to gather uh, in this format, in this uh, way. And uh, we thank you that you are present with us. And as we worship you today, may you be pleased with our worship and may you encourage your people. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today, um, we're going to be looking at in my message all of 1 Samuel 17, but I'm only going to read verses 20 to 50, and I know it's uh, fairly familiar uh, for most of us. So 1 Samuel 17, starting at verse 20 through to verse 50. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed him. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left uh, his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Elab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened uh, on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch for his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the wild an and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. 
This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank deep into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. May the Lord speak to us through this, his word. And let's just take a minute now to pray. Gracious Father, we thank you um, today for your love for us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for the joy that we have in our lives. We thank you for the hope that is in our hearts. We thank you for the peace that you uh, settle in on us as we trust you. And all these things are gifts to us in and through the gift of your son, Jesus, who paid the price for our sins on the cross at Calvary. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you never tire of watching over us, even when we're going through difficult struggles. I know that over these uh, last 16 months, it's been challenging in so many ways for so many people. But Lord, we also know that you are in control. We also know that your, um, your love is unfailing. And Lord, we also know that there are people who are listening to this today that just need your touch for healing, for healing from sickness, for healing emotionally, for healing physically. And Father, we pray that you would touch each one, encourage your people, lead us each day, protect us with the shadow of your wings. And Lord, may we be faithful to follow you in all that we do. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So today we're in our uh, fourth message in our series um, entitled Hanging Tough Through Tough Times. And uh, today's uh, message is entitled Crisis Management. So question for you, who here likes to cheer for the underdog, whether it's in sports or uh, in a movie or, or in life itself? If you listen to the news or watch the uh, Euro Cup final match between Italy and England a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know that England had not won the title in 55 years. Unfortunately, the losing streak continues. Even though I don't follow European football, known as soccer, of course, to us here in North, North America, I was um, silently cheering for England, hoping that their streak would be broken. You know, people love to see someone beat the odds and beat the giant. We love to see the little guy win, whether it is Team Canada beating the USA in hockey or the little guy that wins out over the bully or seeing someone with seemingly Im Im impossible physical or impassable physical ailments surpass everyone's expectations. Did you realize that from a human point of view, when the Christian church began, it had an underdog's chance of succeeding? I mean, think about it. The leader was dead, and 12 uneducated men were expected to carry on his work. In just a few years, 11 of these men had been put to death, while the 12th man had been exiled. The religious and political powers of the early centuries invested a great deal of energy in an attempt to put an end to the Christian church. Yet this underdog movement continued to spread at a phenomenal rate in spite of persecution and oppression. Everyone loves a good underdog story. Although we like to cheer for the underdog, I would venture to say that not many of us really enjoy being the underdog. We like to watch other people overcome tremendous obstacles. We just don't like to have to face the obstacles ourselves. Yet it is inevitable that throughout our lives, we will find ourselves in many situations where we will feel like we're the underdog and we don't see how we can possibly beat the odds. I know that there are some of you listening to this message today that find themselves in that very situation. The challenges are too great. The opposition is too strong. Your resources are too limited, and there's seemingly no way to win. Over the past 16 months, many have found themselves overwhelmed and facing many challenges due to COVID. Families have lost loved ones. Others have lost their job. Business owners have had to close their doors on their dreams. And all of us have found ourselves in a space and time where everything has changed. In our scripture reading today, we heard about a young man who found himself really in a similar situation. The story of David and Goliath has got to be the ultimate underdog story. And today we're going to examine three elements of this story. The crisis, the critics, and the contest. As well as David's response to each one. And as we look at how David responded to each situation, we can learn much about how to deal with the challenges in our own lives. First of all, I want us to notice the crisis. We know that the Israelites were at war with the Philistines. <clears throat> they had come to a standoff, and now Goliath was challenging the Israelites to fight him. The Israelite army was in the midst of a crisis. They were facing a challenge <clears throat> that they didn't believe they could win. Their crisis, in many ways, um, is like the crises that we face in our own lives. So let's consider for a moment the characteristics of the crisis. First of all, the crisis was larger than life. Verses four to seven, a champion named Goliath, was, who was from Gath, came out to the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze 
uh, greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung to his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron uh, point weighed 600 shekels. Talk about indestructible. As far as the Israelite soldiers were concerned, Goliath was too big to be defeated. And you know, that's what we think about the giants that we face as well. Maybe the giant is failing health or a failing marriage or financial problems or a global pandemic. Whatever it is, it seems bigger than we are. Second characteristic of a crisis is that the crisis defies our power. Verses 8 to 11, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, <clears throat> we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. This is what giants do to us. We try to make our lives as smooth as possible. We try to be in control of every detail. And then a crisis comes along and reminds us how completely helpless we are. And the crisis doesn't have to be major. It can be a problem at work or a problem at home or the inability to defeat some bad habit or any number of other things. But it's always there to remind us that we are powerless. Thirdly, the crisis will not go away. Verse 16, for 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. The problem with a crisis is that it won't disappear if you don't deal with it. It deals with you. It doesn't do any good to pretend it doesn't exist. It will continue to haunt you until you face it. The problem is most crises are easy to ignore in the early stages. It's rare that a situation goes from good to crisis level overnight. Usually there is a process of deterioration. There is a breakdown in communication for months, maybe years, before a marriage deteriorates. Financial problems are just an inconvenience for many months until they mushroom into unmanageability. There are often telltale warnings of health problems long before we face the zero hour, but as much as we try to ignore the situation, it just won't go away. At the start of COVID, everything was locked down for two or three weeks, which then was extended month after month. And here we are today. It looks like we can finally see light at the end of the tunnel. However, we do still have a ways to go. So how did David respond to the crisis? In the midst of the crisis, David arrives on the scene. He sees Goliath make his challenge, and he sees the Israelite army overcome with fear. And what is David's response? Listen to what he says, verse 26. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David was able to put the crisis into proper perspective. What we can learn from his example is that the best response to a crisis is to always remember that God is bigger than any problem I will ever face. Amen? God is bigger than any problem I will ever face. So secondly, let us look at the critics in this story. If you desire to do anything worthwhile in life, <clears throat> you will have to learn to endure criticism. If David had adopted the fearful attitude of the Israelite soldiers, if he had been willing to do nothing about the crisis, he would have felt, or he would have been left alone. But as soon as he began to talk about the possibility of defeating the giant, he was met with an onslaught of criticism. David is not the only dreamer in the Bible who was criticized for wanting to do God's will. Noah was, Moses, Joseph, Nehemiah, Paul, Peter, and of course, so was Jesus. 
they were all criticized for attempting to do something great for God's glory. Criticism should not come as a surprise to anyone who wants to accomplish something worthwhile. But that doesn't change the fact that criticism is painful to endure. It's a little easier to endure if you recognize some characteristics of critical people. First of all, critics are obsessed with the trivial. When Eleb, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? David's brother, Eleb, is a typical of most critics. David's about to destroy a major threat to Israel's national security, and his brother is worried about the sheep. Critics have an amazing ability to focus on the trivial and neglect the crucial. Secondly, critics believe the worst about people. Verse 28, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. George Bernard Shaw wrote that hatred is the coward's revenge for being intimidated. The criticism of others serves as a smokescreen to make it less obvious that those who criticize aren't accomplishing anything with their own lives. Francis Asbury, an 18th century bishop in the Methodist movement, uh, was once criticized by a woman for being unsophisticated in his method of evangelism. Asbury politely asked the lady how many she had led to Christ in her life. The lady answered that she had not personally led anyone <clears throat> to faith in Christ. Asbury's response was, Ma'am, I like the way my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. So how did David respond to the critics? David's brother criticized him for wanting to defeat Goliath. He, he accused David of neglecting his responsibilities. He questioned David's motives, and he assaulted David's character. But David's brother never did anything about Goliath. Notice David's response to this criticism. Verse 30, I love this. He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. David refused to be swayed by criticism. He recognized that the critics didn't know what they were talking about, and so he chose to disregard, disregard the criticism, but he wouldn't give up his dream of defeating Goliath. You can be sure that if you try to accomplish anything great for God, you will be criticized by those who are doing nothing. The best response is to disregard the critics, but don't disregard your dream. Next, when it comes to crisis management, let's take a look at the contest. Until David stepped on the battlefield, he, he could be regarded as just a little kid with big ideas. But once he lined up against Goliath, it became obvious that he was a man to be taken seriously. Even if he lost the battle, David proved that he had more character, integrity, and faith than any soldier in the king's army or even than the king himself. David won the contest just by his willingness to enter the contest. Let's look at David's strategy in the battle. David established the terms of battle. Verse 40, Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch, the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Notice that Goliath was forced to fight David on David's terms, not with a sword or a spear, but with five smooth stones. Even the king tried to get David to wear cumbersome battle armor, but David refused. He knew the only way to meet this challenge was by doing what he did best. It is said that the main reason Muhammad Ali was practically unbeatable during his prime was that he always made his opponents fight his fight. He would float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And he always managed to set the pace for the match. 
beneath all the self-adoration laid a great boxer, a library boxer, who knew what he could do best, and he stuck to it. No wonder he made many far more powerful fighters believe he was the greatest. During Norman Vincent Peale's first pastorate, he was faced with a challenging uh, challenge of uniting uh, a bickering church. When he visited the home of one of the feuding ladies, she tried to pull him into the battle by criticizing someone on the other side. But instead, Norman Vincent Peale told the woman about a kind remark someone on the other side had made about her. This disarmed the woman and enabled her to take the first step towards unity. Peel was able to accomplish the seemingly impossible because he didn't let anyone else establish the terms of the battle. Secondly, David refused to be intimidated. Finally, David stood face to face with Goliath. He had nothing but his slingshot and his five smooth stones. When Goliath saw David approach, he tried to intimidate him. Verse 44, Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David refused to be intimidated. He responded by saying, verses 45 to 47, You come against me with a sword and spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel <clears throat> that you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Can you imagine a teenage boy speaking with such boldness to a, an enemy warrior almost twice his size? David refused to be intimidated by Goliath, and he refused to run from the contest. Instead, he approached the contest with boldness. Think about the challenges in your life. <clears throat> How do you speak to your giants? What's your attitude towards the contest? Are you intimidated, or do you dare speak? To the giant with such words as, I'm going to cut off your head. Here is David's response to the contest. Our tendency is to be timid in the face of battle, but that's not the attitude that we see in David. Instead, David approached Goliath with reckless abandon because he knew that the result of the battle was not in his hands. Notice his words to Goliath. Verses 45 and 46, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. David's response to the contest can be summarized in the statement, the battle is the Lord's. Imagine how our attitude towards life challenges would change if we believed these words. We need fear the contest no longer. In fact, we can now approach challenges with abandon. We can laugh in the face of the intimidator because we know that the battle is the Lord's. When you read this story, one of the questions that come to mind is, what did David have that the soldiers of Israel didn't? Why was he able to destroy an enemy that older, more experienced warriors could face? The answer is not that David was brave and the soldiers of Israel were cowards. It has nothing to do with being a winner or a loser. David could face Goliath because he had faith in God's goodness. Since God is good, the crisis cannot last, the critics can't be right, and the contest cannot be lost. Since God is good, the victory is ours. If you're facing a Goliath in your own life, or when the next Goliath comes along, remember David's response to the crisis. God is bigger than my problems. Remember David's response to the critics. He ignored them. And remember David's response to the contest. The battle is the Lord's. David faced Goliath because he believed in God's goodness. And believing in God's goodness will give you the strength to face your Goliath also. 
Let us pray. Gracious Father, again we are so thankful for your word. We are thank you for the we thank you for these um, many examples that we find in your word that give us help, practical help in dealing with uh, our day to day lives, and uh, and you continue to do that uh, through your word to encourage your people, to build your people up, to remind them that you are in control. And as we think of this story, Lord, we think of. <clears throat> And we are reminded that any problems that we may be facing right now, that you are bigger than any problem we'll ever face. And when we desire to follow you and have you lead us, we know there will be uh, critics. May we ignore the critics and keep our eyes focused upon you. And may we always remember that the battle is yours, not ours. So, Lord, increase our faith, especially when it comes to the crises that come into our lives. And we thank you for what you are doing and what you will do through these crises. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we go, let us uh, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>